Hello and welcome to the Knowing and Growing show. I'm Dr Keith Beasley and today I'm talking to Sally Stubbs, who's a leading expert, clinical hypnotherapist and licensed psychotherapist. Like all the people I interview on this show, her role is to help individuals move on in life, to find better yourselves. We're going to be talking about one important facet of her work, which has always fascinated me, the wounded child. Welcome, Sally. Hi there, Keith. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the invitation to be your guest. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> why the wounded child? Child, How did you come to work in this area? And why is it such a powerful thing to do? Uh, the wounded child for me was um, back in the late 1970s. Um, I had a personal crisis and um, I had been uh, nursing but that uh, I've got great friends who are great nurses but nursing didn't suit me I became more and more and more interested in the mind and the power of the mind and the worlds within worlds of the mind and then my own personal crisis when I was having the anxieties the panic attacks the not sleeping and uh, for me, because I'm rather vain, uh, yo-yoing weight was really horrendous. And um, so I went to see a number of therapists. I went from the English Lake District down to London several times, saw some different therapists down there that I'd heard of, a couple of other therapists. And it wasn't really getting to what I needed and uh, I know that they were doing good work and well-meaning work, but it, it just wasn't. It was helping, but it was kind of covering up the panic and covering up the anxiety. So <laughs> basically, I went to college uh, to study psychology um, in uh, the Midlands. And then I went to several other colleges and I was getting some, some gems from different schools of hypnotherapy and psychotherapy. And then I went to the States to study. And uh, my genius teacher, David Grove, um, he uh, was the innovator of freeing and healing the wounded child within. Now that, for me, was the, was the diamond, the polished diamond. So um, basically, I could just briefly say that in the late 70s, my crisis was that um, I was um, married at 18 and within a few months, um, I was abandoned by my husband. So it, was, it looked like an abandonment issue. And uh, the therapists, the brilliant therapists that I went to, we're dealing with abandonment issues in present day um, that I was experiencing as panic and anxiety, insomnia and weight gain and so on. And with David Grove, um, he freed and healed the wounded child within me. Uh, I worked with him as a client from when I was 16 months old and I had a a meningitis and I was uh, in those days isolated in a hospital for about 10 days now of course my parents didn't abandon me but uh, it was those feelings of abandonment and panic and terror within me um, that needed healing up and it was that small infant in me that needed to be freed and then um, in the late 70s, I was um, able to deal as an adult with uh, that challenging experience of the loss of my husband. So that's where I come from personally in my understanding and continuing to research and develop freeing and healing the wounded child within as David gave his work and said, go and grow it. And uh, <laughs> uh, which I have done and polished it. So, so it's when somebody in the present day is suffering with a mind emotional problem, 
it doesn't, that problem doesn't belong to the person in the present day. And 90, arbitrarily 90 over percent of the time, the problem that's manifest in the present day belongs to a much younger fragment of the self. That fragment of the self, yeah, is usually aged between seven to 14 years of age. Wow. <laughs> no, again, I can totally resonate with everything you're saying, and it, it certainly confirms a lot of the things I felt in looking at my own issues and the people I've worked with, and indeed in, in the research I did for my PhD. And as you say, it's increasingly seen that so much, so many of the issues that we have as, as adults have been set there long, long ago. Yes. Okay, so yes. let, me, let me give you an example then. Uh, okay. I, I suffer from anxiety of fear of the unknown, I would put it. So even if I am looking forward to doing something and I know it's something I need to do, if it's new and different, I will get a lot of anxiety. I'll really, my, my stomach will get all churny, I'll get various aches and pains, I'll go through depression and just, yeah, very anxious. And in reflecting on it, uh, and on the basis of what we've just been talking about, I've put it down to the fact that in my childhood, I had a very happy, secure childhood, but everything was very set. There was a pattern. You know, we knew from one year to another what we'd be doing each Sunday, each birthday, and so on. So there was no uncertainty. I just didn't know how to handle uncertainty. Yes. But would that explain my current anxieties? Um, it could do, uh, Keith. Um, the innovation of David Grove was, um, the big innovation of David Grove was a co is called clean language. And the amazing thing about clean language, there's hundreds of amazing things, but I don't want to be boring and go into all the amazing technical things about clean language. But what's interesting about clean language is that I've heard your story, but I don't know. And with clean language, it's almost like as a therapist, I am not there. I am not making any assumptions. I'm not giving any advice with clean language. I'm um, not being directive with clean language. It's like the clean language questions walk beside you and you find, you find where the problem lies. Is that making sense? Sense, yes. And, and I like the fact that you're not saying that you understand me, that you aren't me, that you're not telling me anything. That's wonderful. Yeah. That makes you feel a lot more comfortable. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> wow. So, um, I, it, I believe, and um, I'm not, I'm not uh, imposing a belief upon you because we've uh, emailed a few times and been in touch, that you're okay for me to ask um, today a few clean language questions. Yes, please. And, and I think you know, <laughs> both of my own personal interests, and I'm sure our, our viewers and listeners will, will be fascinated as to what this process entails. And the best way of describing things like this is, is to see them in action. So I'm, I'm happy to be a guinea pig. Yeah, wonderful. You're wonderful. Thank you. So um, the first clean language question is really clean. It will ask you, I'll, I'll say the question, and then I'll just um, discuss it for a few moments, and then I'll ask you the question. The first clean language question for anybody is, and what do you want to have happen? The and, and the way the question is phrased is uh, unusual. So it's inviting an unusual response. That's one of the things that that question is doing. Also, it's really clean because it's got no assumptions in it. So if I asked, and what brought you here today? <clears throat> the attention could go to a bus or a train. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not being flippant, but it's not, it really isn't clean. 
Or um, another therapeutic question might be, um, how are you feeling? Now, there's an assumption in that question that the person has a feeling. They might not have a feeling, which is odd. They might have a thought. They might have an idea. They might have drifted off somewhere in their attention, and they may not have a feeling. So that's just a brief overview of that first question. Okay. So take all the time you need, Keith. And what do you want to have happen? And what do I want to have happen? What I want to happen is to be able to be me without all this inner uh, coming out. What I want to have happen is to be able just to, to, to be myself and to accept that uncertainty is there and why do I need to get all wound up by it? Great. What I want mm. to have happen is, is to enjoy the experience. Okay. So when I'd be working, I wouldn't be doing some explanations, but I'll do a brief explanation of the next question. Um, when uh, you first start a clean language intervention, we're not quite sure which is the most important information in the answer. So it's almost, to begin with, um, just trying one or two questions. I, I'm really, really keen on allegory. And I haven't really got an elegant allegory. So uh, it's a bit like if I was uh, fixing something here and I needed a screwdriver, I might need to try one or two different screwdrivers to begin with. Sorry, it's not an elegant allegory. And this next question is awesomely powerful in that it's an epistemological question. It's asking about individual knowing. And just a brief explanation about this question before I ask it. It's a bit like if we had um, sitting around with us, maybe half a dozen people, and they all said, I'm happy. They all know happy in very different ways. So we our knowing is unique to us. So the next question would be, and when you can't be yourself, how do you know you can't be yourself? And how do I know I can't be myself? I know I can be myself. Mm -hmm. I know deep down that I can just yes. be myself and do all these things. And that's what gets me even more frustrated because I know I can and yet a bit yes. of me is resisting it. Resisting it. Right. Mm, that's the word that I find myself saying, yes. Right. And when you're resisting it, how do you know? You're resisting it. How do I know I'm resisting it? Well, I feel I'm in a conflict. So I feel that different bits of me are wanting different things or pulling me in different directions. So I interpret that as a resistance. Yes. Okay. So did I hear this correctly? You feel it in different bits of you. Okay. About how many different bits do you feel it when you feel that resistance? About how many different bits do I feel it? Yeah. Well, like yeah. my, my, my stomach, for example, will, yes. will start churning. Um, quite exactly what that's saying, and I'm not sure, but that's one of the different bits I will feel. Um, a bit of my brain will be saying, but, 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 but and bringing all sorts of fears and what-ifs questions to mind. Uh, so those are two of the very predominant bits of me. There may okay. be others. So we'll 
ask the next question about the churning stomach. And then I've also noted that there's the, the thinking and the but, but and the what if and those fears. So a little explanation again by allegory. Um, it's a bit like um, if I brought a, a builder into the house and said, I've got a problem in the kitchen and I've got a problem in the bathroom. The builder will note there's two places to attend to, there's two things to attend to, and it's where the builder needs to start with that attention. And from my experience, we start with giving attention to the churning in the stomach. And when this churning in the stomach Whereabouts in the stomach is there churning? Is it like deep inside, all over, at the bottom, in the middle? Take your time. Whereabouts is the churning when there's churning in the stomach? Where about is the churning? The, the answer that comes instinctively is the pit of my stomach. And I don't know where that is physically, but that's the answer that seems to, to be right. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yes, the pit of my stomach. That's, that, that feels good. And the pit of the stomach. And when it's in the pit of the stomach and it's churning, what else could there be about churning in the pit of the stomach? else could it be? So at this point I need to go in and ask it, yes? Yes, that's right. And can you go in and ask it? Take all the time you need to go in and ask it. What else could there be about churning in the pit of the stomach? I just feel I want to cry and release something. It's a pain, it's a fear, it's a... How? <laughs> can't put That's it into right. words. I can't put it into words. I can, I can just feel pain, loss, yeah, it's, I, I just, I, I want to give myself a hug. Yes. Give yourself a hug. Mm. Yes, there's a sort of abandonment feel to it. Um, I hesitated to use that word, but. Yes. But it's, it's certainly a, a feeling of loss there. Yes. I just feel I need to give myself a hug and reassure myself. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, I guess, my, my current me talking to the, the me from some time ago. That's what yes. it feels like anyway. Your me from some time ago. What else? Could there be about your me from some time ago? It feels lonely. It feels mm. unheard. Yes, my goodness. Unheard, unheard is a big one, actually, because that's been yeah. another that's been another issue. But I do get very annoyed when I feel people are not listening to me. Yes. So that that is yes, I think mm. that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could there be any sense of about how old your me could be from a long time ago when your me felt unheard?
I'm not sure it was one particular time. I think it was probably yes. over a period of time. And over a period of time. Yeah. And I don't think it was a, a deliberate thing. I think it was, you know, just yes, people yes. just being busy doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, you know, I don't feel it was a, you know, a deliberate, you know, being ignored because I wasn't wanted or anything. I think it was just yes, a, yes. you know, my my needs were a, a bit too a bit too great to be say satisfied at the time. That sort of thing. Yes. But I certainly did feel I wasn't being hurt. Yes. Yes. Keith, what I'd normally be doing is carrying on working with your younger me from over that period of time for about an hour and a half. <clears throat> so, um, what we need to do for your younger me is to take some time to assist him to be as comfortable as possible and that I can be with him again at a time of your choice. Maybe in the, your courage for your viewers, maybe privately, to discover what your younger me needs and needs to have happen so that he can be heard. Yeah. I like that. Yes. Thank you, Sally. That's fascinating. That's wonderful. And I, I, I mean, I, I've been doing similar work on myself and with other people over the years. And you know, I, I will certainly carry on and, and do my Reiki self-healing and, and various things to carry on what you've just helped and triggered and enabled for me. So, but yeah, I look forward to, uh, to following this up. At, uh, as you say, I'll give myself a a while to, to work on it and we'll touch base again and continue. That is Wonderful. fascinating and, and I'm sure yeah, we've given a, a very good flavour to our, our listeners as to, to what this wounded child and, and clear, what was the phrase? Uh, clear language. Clean language. Clean language is all Clean about. Language, yes. So how would this um, continue and if you were working with someone over a long period, how would this progress? Um, how this would progress is that, um, and, and I'm just a bit generalizing, I understand that, uh, it's, uh, okay, sorry, I'm waffling a little bit to, to uh, get some clarity. How we would progress is that clean language connects with our younger fragment of self that got stuck with a problem. Uh, clean language will talk in uh, particularly metaphor um, and allegory, and that is the language of the younger mind. So in our progression, for one thing, uh, that younger fragment of yourself will find his own solution to being heard and will also discover what else he needs and needs to have happen. And uh, going back to my generalizations, generalizations really are that um, most therapeutic interventions are trying to calm the younger fragment of ourself um, with all kinds of strategies and technologies, but basically to get the younger fragment to feel relaxed, to feel calm, he or she is not relaxed. He or she is not calm. They have a fear, they have a pain, that they maybe have an annoyance that younger fragment is maybe feeling, it's all my fault that this is happening in life, and so on. And so the clean language connecting with that younger fragment he enables the younger fragment to express his or herself in the way they need to. So we're not, we're not asking that younger fragment, I know I'm repeating myself, but it, it's actually quite a lot for your views to take in. That younger fragment 
doesn't want to be told to be calm or relaxed or be quiet or be still. <laughs> the younger fragment of cells often, sometimes not often, but sometimes want to rage about what happened, even though it's you know no fault whatsoever, often of the adults around us or family around us. As for me, uh, my situation that I briefly mentioned at 16 months old, my parents did not abandon me. They did medically what had to happen in those days to put me into isolation for 10 days. Man, that was fearful. That 16 month old kid in me did not want to be told to calm down. <laughs> I, was, I, I mean, I do actually have a visual memory of being in a cot and the adult me can understand that this cot with bars had a lid on it because I could move about and it was safe, the adult in me says, for an infant like that to have a lid on its cot. But that little kid was in a cage and yeah, annoyed and terrified, not just fear, terrified. So how did you uh, express that to, to release it and move on? Um, yes, it's... Uh, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah, no. It, um, a clean language can connect with a pre-verbal child by the adult expressing the feelings cleanly. Yes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we might express that through through painting or a poet, poem or a dance or those sort of things. Yes. Brilliant. I like the sound of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely wonderful, Sally. And uh, you've really explained what this is about. And you know, the exercise we've just done, I'm sure, has it brought it to life for people. So is, is there anything else you would like to say to our, our viewers or listeners to... Um, I, yeah, I'd just like to add that, um, um, at saying that being a therapist, it's almost like I'm not here because I'm not making assumptions or giving directions as such. But from a 30 years experience and all your study of this work, what I knew was important uh, for you, Keith, for the, your younger self, was the churning, because I'm listening for uh, what are called gerunds which are uh, the verbs that end in ing, which means that the younger fragment of self is frozen in moments in time uh, in our earlier life because something didn't complete itself. So it's kind of like if my stomach churns and then I move on and it stops. But, but the, when we connect with the experiences of the anxiety, the churning never, never completed itself. It got frozen in time in those earlier moments of um, fear. And a, a young child can uh, experience fear uh, when an adult, as we know, put an adult to go, don't be silly. But a young child can experience fear as a parent walks through a door and is slamming the door because the parent might be fed up. Mm -hmm. And the, the child can go into a frozen moment of fear just at an adult slamming the door. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I, what you were saying there, yeah, the churning and frozen in time, it, it all makes so much sense. Yes. And I look forward to, to working with that and following this up with you on another occasion. Absolutely wonderful, really? Sally. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your courage to do this on, on the video. Thank you very much.